there. Um, and that was my next question. I don't have to start the recording. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Got it. So um, we'll we'll do uh, the published order, unless the speakers have uh, have different preferences. Um, and uh, what I'll do, I'll, I'll do what Laura did. I will. Uh, I think at the five minute before the end, Mark, I will. Um, I'll do a little clap in the in my video window, and then I'll I'll send a message, private message to the speakers two minutes before the uh, the cut off point, and hopefully your timekeeping will be better than mine was. Um, so, <coughs> sorry, my coffee's just arrived. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. Without further ado, um, our first speaker uh, is Caitlin Shaw, who is a lecturer in film and television at the University of Hertfordshire, so I have the pleasure of being able to call Caitlin a colleague of mine. Um, Caitlin's going to talk about Babylon Berlin, and the title of her paper is uh, To the Truth to the Light, Genericity and Historicity in Babylon Berlin. Um, Caitlin uh, is co-editor of um, The Past in Visual Culture, Essays on Memory, Nostalgia and the Media, which came out in 2017, so her work can be seen there. And she's also published in the Journal of British Cinema and Television and in Cinema, Television and History, New Approaches in 2014. She's particularly interested uh, in research on nostalgia, uh, which is good for, to, for the conference, uh, history and past world building in contemporary transnational quality television drama. Caitlin, to the truth, to the light, over to you. Thank you. OK, hi, everyone. All right. so. Babylon Berlin, uh, which is set amid Germany's interwar Weimar Republic, is adapted from Volker Kutcher's historical detective novels. And it follows Inspector Garion Rott and aspiring homicide detective Charlotta Ritter as they unravel fictional mysteries. Yet it also draws quite heavily on historical phenomena like far left and far right turbulence, illegal rearmament and economic depression. Weimar offers a rich, uh, rich material for historical drama, given its strong reactionary and progressive currents. But it's also highly relevant in a contemporary world of con comparable polarization and populism, intensifying its responsibility to provoke effective historical reflection. So today I'll explore how it does this by exploiting the historical and cultural meanings around two genres film noir, and the musical. So Kutcher's no novels uh, largely follow detective fiction's typical stylistic restraint and emphasis on unraveling a mystery with limited divergence into character or theme. The TV series, by contrast, significantly develops pre-existing characters, it introduces new characters and stories, foregrounds theme, and it collages together Weimar cinema aesthetics with several global modes and genres. As such, it adheres to a concept of quality TV that has become globally popular as digitization has facilitated international uh, distribution and transnational co-productions. It's transnational, so it's co-produced by Germany's public service broadcaster ARD and Sky, and it's further distributed by Netflix. And it's a high budget cinematic production from the highly regarded company X Film Creative Pool uh, and is co-written and directed by Tom Tickber. Its textual infidelity aligns it with other recent TV period dramas, which have departed from more unobtrusive and faithful literary adaptations toward playful original content. And its generic hybridity is also typical of quality TV. And that has undoubtedly expanded its transnational appeal. Um, it's noir and gangster codes, for instance, liken it to the American Boardwalk Empire and the British Peaky Blinders. But Babylon Berlin demonstrates that generosity doesn't have to come at the expense of critical historical reflection. And in fact, it can aid it. So useful here is Vera Dika's response to Frederick Jameson's reading of the postmodern nostalgia film, which he regarded as blankly simulating style and genre at the expense of historicity. Dika argues that in fact, these simulations carry meaning and the work is completed through the audience's active reading and interaction with them. 
Celestino De Leto suggests that because genres are closely linked to social and cultural history, they're often the most relevant ways of visualizing given aspects of life. And historical drama can draw on these ways of visualizing, especially in the hybrid medium of serialized TV, where there's space for digression and expansion. So as I'll suggest today, Babylon Berlin demonstrates this particular potential. So film noir is appropriate uh, for the show in part because the novels recall the hard-boiled detective fiction that inspired many film noirs. It's also thematically well-suited uh, as classic film noirs as existential malaise, their alienated anti-heroes, their femme fatales, are commonly thought to evoke post-war anxieties. Neo-noir's transnational breadth lends it to other national and temporal contexts, uh, and it's fitting for Weimar Berlin, given that several Hollywood noir filmmakers began there and integrated expressionist elements like chiaroscuro lighting uh, and fragmented narrativity. Babylon Berlin references uh, proto-noir Weimar films and develops a more generalized noir palette using chiaroscuro lighting, evoking a black and white feel using dark muted colors and setting sequences along shadowed alleyways, tunnels and rooftops. But noir also serves as a vehicle for historical reflection, drawing on its links to cultural trauma. So the show associates noir with the weight of a past whether insidious tradition or the haunting shadow of the war that threatens progressive change. This is infused into principal characters who in turn distill complex cultural forces. I'll look at this today via two characters. So protagonist Garion Rat, pictured here and psychiatrist Dr. Schmidt. So in the first novel, Garion recalls hard and cynical detectives like Philip Marlowe and Sam Spade. He's recklessly dogged having been transferred to Berlin from Cologne for shooting the wrong man, and he can be hard drinking and abrasive. Babylon Berlin's Garion visually recalls classic noir uh, detectives. So recurrent shots depict him wandering alone in fedora and trench coat through Berlin's streets, often in shallow focus to emphasize his alienation. Yet he's gentler than his inspiration and his doggedness is reconceptualized as social concern, confounding expectations of the hard-boiled detective. Here he's sent temporarily to Berlin by his conservative autocratic Catholic father to destroy a porn film featuring high-ranking figures that's being used for political blackmail. When he eventually discovers that his father is in the film, he's compelled to remain in Berlin because as he explains, he can't return to a life which shirks the truth. So it's not his own recklessness then, but idealism that keeps him in Berlin. And this and other adaptations to his character split his noir persona and his internal identity. The show reimagines his hard exterior as a mask that satisfies the demands of his constraining conservative upbringing, metonymizing the suppression of strains of progressive idealism by Weimar's corrupt elites, exemplified by his father. Meanwhile, the show amplifies and historicizes the film noir protagonist's tendency to be psychologically disturbed. So its version of Garion suffers from severe PTSD or shell shock and is addicted to an unnamed drug to alleviate his trembling. So when his war trauma is triggered, it instigates noir's canted camera angles and extreme shadow and it frag fragments the narrative which flashes both forward and back. Because Garion's trauma is linked to these noir codes and conventions, it's in turn projected onto Berlin. So classic film noirs drew on what uh, James Nearmore describes as the dark city, a literary topos in which the streets at night were transformed into the privileged uh, mise-en-scene of the masculine unconscious. So in Garion's late night wanderings, his angst is grafted on Berlin, evoking what can't be distilled rep representationally. So suppressed traumas around Germany's loss of the First World War and its consequent economic, social, and political turbulence. Meanwhile, Dr. Schmidt, who isn't adapted but is rather unique to the program, 
recalls early 20th century psychiatrists who treated shell shock sufferers. Yet his connections to noir distance him from historical realism. So he's connected to Berlin's gangland via his former patient, gangster Edgar Kasabian. And the two lead Garion unknowingly into Schmidt's treatment method, um, coercing his pharmacist to switch his medication uh, and also compelling him to tune into a radio frequency where Schmidt broadcasts his hypnotic suggestive therapy. This calls up two fictional psychiatrists from proto-noir Weimar texts, Dr. Caligari and Dr. Mabuza. So Anton Kays argues that the unsolved question around Caligari as brilliant psychiatrist, clever charlatan, or both, and the criminal mastermind Dr. Mabuza's use of hypnosis for control evoke post-war anxieties around shell shock and hypnosis and convey a pervasive sense of manipulation and powerlessness. So like Caligari, Schmidt's integrity is uncertain. So in a lecture, at one point, he appears benevolent, defending shell shock sufferers against accusations that they're simulators or cowards. But it also resembles one delivered by Mabuza's alter ego, Professor Baum, who's eventually revealed to commit crimes under Mabuza's influence. His use of radio transmission also recalls Mabuza's use of a loudspeaker, which Edward D. Miller notes compels his listeners to lose autonomy. Beyond these Weimar references, generalized noir codes draw out Schmidt's ambivalence. So this is notable in a series three sequence. So after Schmidt has compelled Garion to replace his drug habit with Schmidt's suggestive therapy, Garion approaches an advertising column on a shadowed street, opens a hidden door and descends to an underground, underground tunnel where Schmidt uh, conducts a, radio, a therapy session with him over radio broadcast. So although Schmidt seemingly benignly encourages Garion to uh, accept his own self-deception, the sinister noir aesthetic invites a more insidious reading of his words. So Garion is made to repeat to the truth, to the light, after which the sequence cuts to a crowd of uh, Schmidt's shell shock patients who listen and also repeat, seeming like Mabuza's listeners to have lost autonomy. So if Garion's trauma embodies the nations, then his manipulation by Schmidt metonymizes the vulnerability of a traumatized nation to uh, problematic promises of absolute truth. In a later broadcast, Schmidt reveals his agenda, claiming that the mind injured by war is the best foundation for creating a new man machine, which is free from pain and fear. This rings of what Roger Griffin describes as scientism, so the blend of positivist science with palingenetic myths of societal regeneration, which fostered the development of Nazism's alternative modernity. So like Dr. Mabuza, Schmidt holds a holistic sway over Babylon Berlin's universe. He's the wealthy conservative Alfred Newson's therapist and his holdover Kasabian and Garion lead lends him influence over Berlin's criminal underworld and its police force. So as such, he evokes the insidious encroachment of questionable ideologies across a vulnerable society. Now Babylon Berlin also draws heavily from the musical and like film noir, this is fitting. So Weimar is remembered for its subversive music and cabaret. The show features frequent extended musical sequences depicting Berlin's nightlife in spaces like the subversive Hollander and the lavish multi-level uh, Mocha Efti. At the latter, Charlotta Ritter works by night in its brothel while dancing to regular, number, re regular numbers performed in Marlena Dietrich style drag by the singer Nikoros. So in the second episode, she performs a song written for the show. And this five minute sequence is constructed according to the conventions of musical numbers. Uh, so the audience performs a choreographed dance routine with dynamic cinematography and editing, uh, emphasizing spectacle and excess. The new textual system conflicts with noir. 
So the palette is brighter and it's richer and the ecstatic mood departs starkly from noir's somber foreboding. Now, Richard Dyer's concept of entertainment's utopianism helps to conceptualize the musical number in Babylon Berlin. So he argues that popular entertainment's relationship to commercialism is necessarily ambivalent and its central thrust is utopianism. So musicals stimulate this in their musical numbers Alternate, alternating between the heavily representational and verisimilitudinous, pointing to the way the world is, and the heavily non-representational and unreal, the pointing to how things could be better. In Babylon Berlin, this is activated to offset viewers' assumed awareness of its character's bleak future. The program assigns the feeling of hopeful euphoria induced by performing music and dancing to a collective wave of pro progressive impulses across society and pits these against the burden of the past expressed in noir. It permeates music venues notable in Charlotta's development. So in daily life, she's weighed by her family's severe poverty and works by day in a restrictive patriarchal system, longing to be a detective but forced to take odd stenographical and secretarial work for the police department. However, by night at the Mocha Efti, she's freed, her sex work affording her the power to support herself, borrow the brothel's extravagant clothes, and drink the Mocha Efti's expensive champagne. So as Dyer argues is true of musicals, it's paradoxically by absorbing capitalism's commodities that Charlotta embodies a fantasy of power, one that she begins to realize when she's appointed assistant detective. Yet the musical's utopianism is activated elsewhere, not just in subversive spaces, because its idealism runs alongside malaise across all of society. So this can be seen in Garion. So where film noir expresses a past that entraps him, his love of music and dancing repeatedly liberates his idealistic core. This is first signaled near the end of the first episode when he enters an ordinary pub and after do, doing a slapstick stunt with his cigarette, reveals himself to be a remarkable dancer. So this early surprising moment of exuberant creativity challenges noir expectation, revealing what his hard exterior conceals. Elsewhere, this interchange between reality's constraints and the musical number's potential to dream beyond them is more explicitly oppositional. So in series three, Charlotta and her younger sister, Tony, share a flat, a flat with a man they've never met. So he uses it by day and they use it by night and they're forced to clean up after him when they arrive. In a sequence that recalls depression era backstage Hollywood musicals, they clean his mess while singing and dancing to gender fluid cabaret star Claire Waldorf's brashly feminist song, Get Rid of the Men, harnessing the emancipatory power of both the song and the musical number. Likewise, uh, in a um, sequence at his birthday party, police photographer Reinhold Graff performs in drag a love song he has written as the object of his uh, unconfessed love, Fred Jacobi looks on. As he sings, the sequence cuts from his apartment to an imagined stage where Graff and Jac Jacobi dance alone beneath a spotlight. This introduction of this heavily non-representational space facilitated by the music, musical number enables the expression of transgressive love. Here the musical's utopianism is an enlightened force that pushes back against film noir's trauma-induced reactionary anxieties and fears. So by assigning Weimar's progressive and reactionary undercurrents to genre codes, Babylon Berlin discourages readings according to the commonly repeated meta-narrative of Weimar as a doomed republic, mistakenly viewing the Nazi period in hindsight as inevitable, and instead invites viewers to consider multiple theoretical outcomes, both historically and by extension in the present day. So this is in part because generic codes resist the reducibility of hard facts 
reveling in non-representational ambiguity, and also because they can permeate the same characters, spaces, institutions, and plot points, suggesting unpredictable ambivalence in every facet of Weimar life. In turn, Babylon Berlin's complex genericity is valuable because its access and subjectivity encourages emotional identification. So this is notable in Garion, who, like Weimar's democracy, is torn between reactionary instincts brought on by trauma and progressive instincts that drive him toward acts of resistance, like hiding his blacklisted left-wing Jewish journalist friend from his Nazi-enabling superior. By metonymizing the competing drives that characterized Weimar society in its central protagonist, Babylon Berlin encourages emotional identification with this internal tension and concern for the outcome. It also highlights that what one might know came to pass after Weimar was no more historically inevitable than it is narratively inevitable that Garion's regressive instincts will prevail. This underlying hope unfixes the future, playing what viewers know happened against the emotive possibility of what might be as generic excess open space for imagination. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. And actually, uh, 19 and a half minutes, <laughs> which I think is astonishing. So uh, I bow before you. Um, Okay, moving on. So we have uh, we have four really interesting papers, uh, and we'll we'll take questions at the end, of course. Um, so our next paper is from uh, Tom Watson. Uh, Thomas Joseph Watson is a lecturer in transmedia production at Teesside University. Um, his researching interests include representations of cinematic violence, cultural extremity, and niche music subcultures. Uh, and Tom's paper for today is called Based on Truth, Lies, and What Actually Happened, Representations of Norwegian Black Metal and Prosthetic Memory in Jonas Ackerland's Lords of Chaos. Take it away, Tom. Can everyone see my screen all right? Because I'm, I'm used to um, collaborating teams rather than Zoom, so hopefully that's, uh, that's on the screen. Yes, marvellous. Okay. Um, there's a little, little bit of a strange setup. So I've got my screen on my laptop and my iPad to the side. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read my paper off here. So if I'm looking off screen, that, that's the reason why. Okay. Um, so I'll just, I'll just begin. So um, just to offer some wider context for this particular paper, um, it is worth pointing out that this is part of a wider project that I am developing around themes of violence and transgression within subcultures um, of extremity. At the moment, I am researching examples of contemporary power violence, power electronics and noise, and how these subcultures can relate to violent performance and catharsis. Um, this is built upon work I recently completed considering subcultures of punk and extremist politics, which I hope to develop into a cultural history of punk exploitation cinema um, at some point in the, in the near future. Um, so a brief digression into the world of Norwegian black metal is perhaps not a random occurrence. Um, as this conference takes the wider themes of genre and nostalgia as its focus, I would like to start by offering you all my own nostalgic insight into the music consumption practices of a teenage boy from the northeast of England. Um, and I am talking about myself here, of course. Um, the first ever issue of Kerrang! magazine that I ever received was the December 2001 issue featuring both the Hives and Andrew WK in their prime and the much blind Nickelback, um, about whom I will not say anything further unless um, there's any fans um, amongst us in the audience. Um, being an ardent subscriber to what was then the most popular uh, rock magazine in the UK, um, it wasn't until several years later in 2008 that I was immediately struck by the work of American documentary photographer Peter Best and the centerfold spread dedicated to his work. Okay. Um, Best was in the midst of promoting his collected subcultural photography opus entitled True Norwegian Black Metal, We Turn in the Night, Consumed by Fire, the subtitle itself a translation of the Latin palindrome known as the Devil's Verse. Best was being interviewed alongside significant insights into the selected photographic imagery he had taken and collated from the Norwegian black metal scene as it then stood, documenting those key figures that were maintaining some of the transgressive legacy that had dominated the scene a decade previously. The work of Peter Best, through the prism of Kerrang! magazine, 
served as my introduction into what is still considered to be the most extreme music subculture of the 20th century. And it was also Kerrang! magazine that brought the notoriety and violence of the scene to the attention of a global audience in the early 1990s. Originally published by Feral House in 1998 and preceding the work of Best by a decade, Michael Monihans and Diedrich Soderlein's Lords of Chaos, The Bloody Rise of the Satanic Metal Underground, chronicled the evolution of Northern European black metal in detail, paying specific focus to the scene of a recognized second wave, the aforenoted true Norwegian black metal. In terms of memory and ideas of truth, the book itself and the narrative presented remains an object of dispute. Former editor of extreme music publication, Terrorizer, Jonathan Seltzer, argues how, when I quote, it's another telling paradox that it's considered equally a hugely important text for understanding the nature of the black metal scene and an ideologically loaded, unreliable account, end quote. And I believe this is in no small part due to the fact that dispersions have since been cast towards Korth and Monihan and his unquestioning sympathies with the fascist and neo-fascist ideologies of some Norwegian black metal practitioners noted in the first edition of the book. Generally regarded as one of the more controversial and transgressive subcultural moments, the black metal scene and later movement has been afforded numerous interventions in terms of academic criticism. One of the most prominent examples of this is the work of Keith Con Harris and the monograph Extreme Metal, Music and Culture on the Edge, which points to the specific modes of transgression that function within this scene. Indeed, as Con Harris illustrates, Extreme Metal, of which black metal is an example, presents a combination of sonic, discursive and bodily transgressions, However, for Con Harris, musicians and fans might play with the imagery of violence, but their actions within the, within the scene mostly revolve around the more ordinary activities of listening to music, writing to other fans, and collecting and exchanging records. For Con Harris, the logic of mundanity is what enables scene members to explore transgressive themes textually without their own behavior of the scene itself ever becoming unequivocally transgressive. There is, in essence, a safe space here whereby transgressive themes can indeed be flirted with, but without really causing any significant damage or harm. Indeed, a commitment to overly transgressive practice threatens the very survival of the extreme metal scene as it inevitably leads to the death or imprisonment of scene members, something undesirable for most extreme metal aficionados. An extension of Con Harris's work, Michelle Filipov suggests that, and I quote, Norwegian black metal scene in the 1990s is perhaps metal's most famous example of the prestige and status that can be gleaned from connecting music to real acts of transgression. This is one case in which violent imagery was employed not simply as part of a performance of transgression, but as a serious attempt to construct music as a springboard from which violent actions could logically emerge. As such, the lasting image of Norwegian black metal has been characterized by church burnings, the exploitation and valorization of suicide, grave desecration, violent xenophobia, and brutal murder. At the center of such extremity were the bands Mayhem and Burzum, fronted respectively by Ogston Euronymous Arsef, who was viciously murdered by Varg Kant Grishnak or Erv the central antagonists in the initial Lords of Chaos publication. The events of the true Norwegian black metal second wave have been told, contested and retold across numerous documentaries, press reports and interviews from surviving members of the scene. A growing bank of feature films and documentaries now exists that focuses on the Norwegian black metal scene and the subcultural tenets and values it carried forwards, um, perhaps the most notable being true Norwegian black metal until the light takes us and once upon a time in Norway all of which were released between 2007 and 2008, uh, the respective images for these films uh, on the screen at the moment. The most recent representation of this subcultural era is the fictionalized account Lords of Chaos, directed by Swedish filmmaker Jonas Ackerlund, himself a founding member of the pioneering Swedish black metal band Bathory. Existing somewhere between true crime docudrama dark comedy, horror cinema, and the rock biopic, the current paper takes Lords of Chaos as a genre hybrid depicting this controversial history, but in a way that questions ideas of historical veracity, historiography, authorship, and subcultural mythology. The film itself has sustained levels of critical backlash from fans and those directly implicated in the events depicted, leading to wider questions of narrative ownership, the authenticity of testimony, and subcultural investment in this contested history. The film itself was produced by Vice Films, an offshoot of Vice Media that was also responsible for Best's True Norwegian Black Metal volume 
and his own documentary series of the same name released in 2007, um, the examples I mentioned previously. As such, a sense of ownership and narrative shaping exists in relation to the involvement of vice as a brand interested and invested in unusual subcultures and their members. Additionally, Ackerland himself has raised these issues of ownership and statements made about Lords of Chaos while promoting the film's release. And of course, a lot of people out there think they own this story. They think it's more important to them than anybody else. There's a ton of people that weren't even born when this happened, that have a lot of opinions about it and think they own it. It's like their story. So using the foundational work of Alison Landsberg and the, developments con uh, the developed concept of prosthetic memory as a starting point, Lords of Chaos will be offered as a text through which the more traditional forms of memory that are premised on claims of authenticity, heritage and ownership can effectively be challenged. So Landsberg's central argument is that, and I quote, modernity makes possible and necessary a new form of public cultural memory, which is noted as prosthetic memory. As Landsberg explains, prosthetic memory ex emerges at the interface between a person and historical narrative about the past at an experiential site, such as a movie theater or a museum. In this moment of contact, an experience occurs through which the person shooters himself or herself into a larger history. The person does not simply apprehend a historical narrative, but takes on a more personal, deeply felt memory of a past event through which he or she did not live. The resulting prosthetic memory has the ability to shape that person's subjectivity and politics. So further to this, and effectively building on the sentiments voiced by Jonas Ackerland earlier, Prosthetic memory argues that the technologies of mass culture and the capitalist economy of which they are part of open up a world of images outside a person's directly lived experience, creating a portable, fluid and non-essentialist form of memory. And Landsberg argues that the central idea that cultural memories no longer have exclusive owners and that they do not naturally belong to anyone. So this process is intensified when we consider the competing narratives that go on to tell similar versions of the same story, but from a multitude of perspectives and claims to authenticity, ideas that are further compounded and complicated when we consider Lords of Chaos. Adding to this are questions of subcultural capital, whereby the narrative presented by the film is a version of a mythos that people may be familiar with because of its notoriety or representations elsewhere. As such, the film offers an alternative outlook on the causes and consequences of the scene's violence, ideology, and depictions of toxic masculinity. One that is perhaps more, uh, sorry, one that is perhaps a lot more critical than previous depictions have allowed for. As Landsberg goes on to argue, the unreliability of memory in the modern age, combined with the ruthlessness of the present, compels people to engage in memory projects, projects of narration and genealogy that make the past recognizable and potentially interpolative. Questions therefore rise as to whether this is a representation of a right and reality that we can now accept. So the film opens with the stark claim that it is based on truth, lies, and what actually happens, an immediate self-reflexive, self-aware statement that acknowledges the contested history and resounding mythology of the events the film then goes on to fictionalize. And this was also something that was included in the film's marketing materials. Jonathan Seltzer argues how the film represents a central narrative whose fundamental unanswerable mysteries have proven wide open to interpretation and whose significance countless parties have laid claim to ever since. Assertions of authenticity and veracity are therefore, therefore left open to dispute as the film begins. And such openness was ultimately marked as something of an issue for black metal fans, members of bands linked to the scene, and those directly responsible for the violent acts depicted. Claims of inaccuracy, artistic license, and outright fabrication were leveled at the film upon its release, and criticisms of Ackerland alongside co-writer Dennis Magnusson accused them of taking the temples of the story and filling in the gaps however they saw fit, colouring the pictures in with their own guesses as to what actually happened, Rolling Stone magazine going as far to say that the film should have been burned on the cross. So a nice bit of appropriate rhetoric for you there. So founding place, bass player um, John Necrobutcher, Necrobutcher um, Stubberoons, who still plays with the band Mayhem, argued that the film was not done correctly and how he considered it to be highly exploitative of its subject matter. And the bass player still very much mourning the loss of his bandmates and friends and also voicing his wishes that he had been consulted in the creation of the film. Although whether this did actually occur or not is a matter of some dispute between the band and the director, Ackerland. 
The divisiveness of the film within wider black metal fandom seemingly ignores the fact that Lords of Chaos is not really about the true Norwegian black metal scene in its strictest sense, but rather a snapshot biopic told through the perspective of one of its central, albeit now deceased, progenitors. As the film continues, the audience is introduced to the central figure acting as a narrator of sorts, foreshadowing the fatal consequences yet to unfold, and again emphasizing the self-referential tone of the film. I quote from the film, that's me, an average teenager you may think, but you couldn't be more wrong. I am Oystein Arseth, aka Euronymous, and I was brought to this world to create suffering, chaos, and death. This is my story, and it will end badly. It is through the eyes of Euronymous that we see the development of the second wave scene, perhaps most poignantly the recruitment and eventual brutal suicide of Mayhem Vocus, Pell, Dead, Orlin in the film's earlier stages. As argued by Matthew P. Unger in his book, Sound, Symbol and Sociality, the aesthetic experience of extreme metal music, a major media event was the suicide of Mayhem Singer and the subsequent spectacle of his brain matter and skull. Apparently when band member Euronymous found dead, dead, he made necklaces with bits of his skull and took a picture of the scene that was to become a limited run of one of their album covers. And that, that is perhaps one of the most prominent instances of black metal folklore and replicated in the initial Lords of Chaos publication. The way that this event is handled by the film is interesting in that it belies the accepted nature, narrative of what actually happens or the version of events that has been repeated the most in order to gain traction and veracity. The film graphically depicts the self-harm committed by Dead on stage and the moment where he commits suicide via a self-inflicted gunshot. The film also shows the moments where Euronymous discovers the body of his friends, only then to go and secure a disposable camera in order to pose and take photographs of the corpse, taking some of the skull fragments to be made independence for the other band members and associates within the scene. These events resulted in the now infamous Dawn of the Black Hearts EP, a censored version of which I've placed on the coming slide here. As the narrative progresses, Euronymous is shown to mourn the death of his friend and experiences what may be described as post-traumatic stress in some of the most aesthetically horrific, horrific sequences later in the film. Contrasting to the narrative of dominance, misanthropy and control that has previously personified the figure of Euronymous, he appears to have actually shared a close loving friendship um, and relationship with his departed friend. For Landsberg, corresponding to ideas of prosthetic memory, these sequences can be read as instances of effective encounter, whereby I quote, powerful moments of interruption, break the illusion of connection with a character or a sense of understanding exactly what their experiences was like, Promote prompting questions and critiques and compelling self-evaluation. As such, the different reactions of Euronymous to the suicide of his bandmate signals something that has never been told before. And whether or not this is for dramatic effect or artistic license remains to be seen. Um, and it allows for other possibilities to become part of the story. The film also depicts the infamous church burnings and the escalating competitive encounters with Varg Vikernes and the power struggles that ensued between Mayhem and Burzum, which impacted palpably across the scene and the ensuing moral panic that went on to cause outrage across Oslo and wider Norway. Copies of actual documentation are also reproduced in the film that echo key aspects of the scene's mythology, mediating these images further within the context of this new narrative frame and granting a further sense of veracity alongside the dramatization. This has also proven to be problematic for many of the films of four noted critics that have been outright hostile to the film as a memory project, to paraphrase Landsberg. As Jonathan Seltzer has it, the story of Mayhem is an example of a creation myth which shares a complex relationship between fans and artists alike. So much so that, and I quote, as much as many in the black metal scene want to move past the events that unfolded and are very wary of them being re-litigated, everyone from those that were there at the time to newcomers has a personal investment in the tale, even if they don't condone murder, arson, suicide, or the full range of ideologies expounded by Varg V. Kenes, over the years. Attention is therefore present, whereby the only way to tell this story is to effectively re reinterpret the events that many within the scene would like to forget or leave in the past. So book ending the film is the final statement of Euronymous as narrator, effectively forming an epitaph of sorts from beyond the grave. As the sorrowful music of Sigaros plays over the final montage, largely comprised, comprising the arrest of Varg and the global reportage of the murder of Euronymous, 
the images are punctuated by this final monologue. I quote, there you have it, my story. I told you it was going to end badly. No, fuck, stop the sentimental shit. There's nothing sad about my death or my life. I'm Euronymous, founder of Mayhem, the most infamous black metal band in the world. I had my own record store. I had my own record label. I created a whole new musical genre, true Norwegian black metal. And I created Mayhem. What the fuck have you done lately? Pause it. The call to stop the sentimental shit and to accept the wide impact of the extreme black metal subculture is perhaps the final tension and contradiction here within Lords of Chaos. The final moments of Euronymous's life signal how he was a figure in over his head, a savage promoter and cultural agitator that effectively allowed circumstances to better him with tragic consequences. At the same time, the film depicts him as an accomplice to arson and an enabler of murder. Lords of Chaos perhaps stands as a further way we will never really fully know the truth, the lies, or what actually happened amidst this turbulent, murderous period of recent European history. And, and that's a, an interesting image to kind of end on there. And I, and I am done. Thank you, Tom. And you're actually two minutes under, so um, I'm being further shamed. My Kerrang reading <laughs> years were obviously earlier than yours. It, it got livelier after I stopped reading. <laughs> um, okay, thanks very much. Um, and obviously, hopefully there'll be some uh, questions for you at the end. If we move on now to um, Vincent Gain. Vincent, are you there? I am, although I just tried to start my video. I think you need to release it or the host does. I think if, try again now, because I think uh, Tom's let go of it and. That's, that's me, just one second, Vincent, sorry. I'm loving your Elsa Lanchester impression, Laura. Oh, thanks. Uncanny. There As we go, Gary sorry Olsen about project. that. Should be good now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, so Vincent Gain is a lecturer at King's College London. Um, in the past, Direction. he has taught- London, Visiting research fellow. Visiting research fellow at King's College London, which sounds very glamorous. Um, previously taught at Loughborough and uh, at UEA, uh, East Anglia. Um, research focuses on the intersection of globalization, liminality and identity politics in media, um, monograph uh, existentialism and social engagement in the films of Michael Mann has been published by Polgrave and uh, Vincent has also published on superhero cinema production cycles and post 9-11 film. Uh, he's currently uh, researching spies, superheroes and Boston, Massachusetts or Lincolnshire? Massachusetts. Thought as much. Um, so Vincent's um, paper for today is The Spy with the Blood-Tinted Glasses, Nostalgic Espionage of the 21st Century. All yours, Vincent. Lovely. Um, hang on a tick. It's just... Oh, for goodness sake. Oh, no, that's fine. Okay, sorry, it's just saying it wants to record and I need to allow it to. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Right, sorry folks, bit of a hold up here in sharing things. Right, yes, fine. <sighs> One of those Zoom moments. Indeed. Oh, good Lord. It says it can't record the contents of my screen until it's quit, so I'll be right back. No problem, Vincent. Okay. These things happen. I think at moments like this, everyone just find a window to uh, gaze wistfully out of. That's the best plan. See Vincent's back, so hopefully we'll be all right. Hopefully, yes. Oh dear, I seem to be fading into my background. Let me just uh, remove it. <laughs> That's better. Okay, now let's see if this will work. That looks promising. Right. 
Everyone seeing that okay? Brilliant. Yeah, that looks good, Vincent. Yeah. Okay. Doki. In screening the past, memory and nostalgia in cinema, Pam Cook argues, looking to the future inevitably involves a reassessment of the past and an opportunity to take stock in the present. Such reassessment is a common feature of historical dramas, and it is central to a distinct subgenre of film and TV spy narratives in the early 21st century. Through the lens of history, these films critically engage with contemporary concerns around memory, trauma, nationalism, and nostalgia. This subgenre is nostalgic espionage, or espionalgia, as I call it, a spy narrative that emphasizes the history of spying and the spy genre in its narrative, style, and thematic content. Across this range of products, common features abound, features that constitute a subgenre that has developed and could only have developed in the first two decades of the 21st century. As you can see, there's quite a lot of them. This is a full-scale book project, um, but this little paper is where it starts from. Don't worry, I'm not gonna talk about everything. The past 20 years have seen a rise in nostalgia, especially in relation to nationalism. This was especially prominent in 2016 with the EU referendum in the UK and the US presidential election. Slogans emphasized regaining something, take back control, make America great again. What were they referring to? What had been lost? The rhetoric of the Trump and leave the EU campaigns both made reference to something nebulous and hard to define something which may never have existed in the first place. These nostalgia boosted nationalist sentiments had been growing with particular prominence in the UK and USA, at least since the September 11th attacks in 2001. 9-11 proved to be a social, political and cultural trauma that is yet to heal. Since 2001, the global, a global war on terror was publicized. Political extremism increased, the world economy collapsed and global pandemics broke out. Amidst such uncertainty and indeed fear, it is perhaps understandable that a wish emerged for the past, a time which can be construed as a better time because it was not as bad as things are now. So let's get back to the good old days, the underlying rhetoric of the campaigns mentioned above. Key to this rhetoric is nostalgia a wish for certainty that is guaranteed by being in the past. Refer to something that is past and therefore absent, and this absence becomes something to focus attention on. The absence itself thus becomes the object, not the tangible benefits of how things were or how we imagine they were, but the immediate absence which needs to be filled. In the current cases, nationalistic ideologies were used to fill this absence to successful effect. It might seem strange to miss World War II and the Cold War. The first, the bloodiest conflict in human history, did at least provide a clear sense of which side to be on, fascist dictatorship or not. The second, an even longer and more drawn out ideological, economic and military contest with its associated threat of mutually assured destruction, provided a unifying meta-narrative, much as 21st century nationalism has done. During these conflicts, to voice an opinion contrary to the national narrative was to run the risk of being labeled a traitor. Treason was punishable by death, while even suspected sympathies toward the opposing side led to intense scrutiny and victimization, as demonstrated by the 1950s witch hunts. Not that such rhetoric stops the creative industries from casting a critical eye on events both past and present. Much as popular entertainment of past decades highlighted problems such as the nuclear arms race, race relations, and the Vietnam War, espionalgia has developed in the years since 9-11. Espionalgia uses historical recreation to highlight contemporary issues, 
offering an alternative to nationalist rhetoric, a, spa, a type of critical nostalgia. In doing so, these products combine generic elements of the spy thriller with those of the historical drama. These elements play to a range of audiences, attract varying critical responses, and are especially illustrative of their time. Espionalgia is a consistent critical voice in cultural discourses around nationalism, patriotism, social identity, and the relationship between past and present. Martin Rubin identifies the thriller as a modern narrative form in response to industrialization and urbanization. To extend this conceit, the spy thriller is a response to globalization with espionage as the implementation of foreign policy within a global context. The ubiquity of spies highlights globalization and the permeable boundaries of nations. This became increasingly the case following World War II and continues apace in the current era of globalized technology. Tracy Jenkins points out that the high-tech gadgetry has been a staple of the spy genre since the introduction of the James Bond franchise and indeed, technology is a widely accepted feature of the genre. From Patriot Games to Kingsman, The Secret Service to Homeland, technology appears in the form of cell phones, computers, satellites, and ever more fantastical devices with seemingly unlimited power. Jenkins points out that according to the movies, intelligence agencies use advanced disguises, voice imitation software, facial recognition technology, and weaponry hidden in the unlikeliest of places. The agency can also trace any document, replicate any object, track a person's every credit card, purchase and follow someone across the globe in real time using satellite zoom lenses. This technology may be pure science fiction, but it adds to the film's presentation of sophisticated espionage agencies having omnipotent and omnipresent power, according to Jenkins. Sometimes, however, technology is more grounded as filmmakers seek advice. Jenkins notes that filmmakers often consult with CIA officers to learn about the agency's technological capabilities in order to enhance accuracy or realism. For filmmakers to ascertain the actual technical capabilities demonstrates the importance of technology for the spy genre. In some cases, the omnipresence of technology extends to the point of fetishization. The sheer volume of technological devices, as well as the ongoing jargon around servers, ports, satellite positions, can seem overwhelming. Crucially, it is also distancing. When everything is on screen, is on a screen, various levels of mediation are at work. At the climax of Zero Dark Thirty, the final assault on Osama bin Laden's compound is largely viewed through the mediator of, La of night vision POV. This mediation can have the effect of reducing people to information and, to use genre jargon, assets. Espionalgia actively avoids the omnipresent technology of contemporary set spy films. The question is, therefore, what is left when technology is removed? In espionalgia, spies are unable to rely upon gadgets such as satellite surveillance, constant communication, such as mobile phones that never run out of power. Instead, espionalgia emphasizes spycraft such as meets, exchanges, and drops, often in rather shabby locations. The spy genre has long traded on romance and exoticism in its locations. Clothes, cars, and connections between tourists and spies date from the 1930s. The romanticism of travel is even referred to in 2006's The Good Shepherd. Edward Wilson announces he's going overseas and his wife Clover asks him if he's going to save the world. Wilson's mission is far more mundane and his travel deglamorized by the Spartan locations. The production design of espionalgia is often drab and dilapidated. East Berlin in the debt, foggy London town in Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, a cluttered living room in Argo. The worn down locations of, of espionalgia create a sense of age, 
added to by the world weariness of the characters who embody the toll that espionage takes. The absence of technology can create a greater sense of realism, which may be supported by the intelligence community itself. Jenkins documents that since the early 1990s, the CIA has assisted Hollywood with film and TV representations, allegedly out of a desire for fairness and accuracy. Sometimes scripts are reviewed for authenticity and crews are allowed to film at Langley, while the agency's entertainment liaison reviews projects that increase understanding of the agency and install pride in its employees. Entertainment liaison Chase Brandon assisted multiple Hollywood projects that could be marked as, quote, authentic and accurate, end quote, partially as recruitment advertising for the CIA. Other representation is less well received at Langley, however. Retired CIA agents work in Hollywood as consultants, and according to retired CIA officer Basil Baz, these retirees offer, a, a, quote, an unvarnished view of the CIA causing viewers to see these more negative films as historically accurate, end quote. The historical detail of espionage, along with the film's consultants, indicates a concern with realism and accuracy. This is especially the case with retiree Milt Bearden's collaboration with the creators of The Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd is a fictionalized tale of the history of the CIA from its inception as the Office of Strategic Services during World War II through nearly two decades of the Cold War before concluding in the aftermath of the Bay of Pigs debacle. The film's attention to historical detail, which paints the CIA in a less than flattering light, earned the disapproval of the agency because of the film's association with retired CIA officers and their docu-dramatic elements, which both suggested to the viewers that the film was plausible and even historically accurate. Notably, the Good Shepherd does not present the CIA through rose-tinted glasses, but rather through glasses tinted with blood. The Good Shepherd repeatedly depicts the morally dubious actions of the CIA, but interestingly omits moral qualms on the part of the protagonist. Throughout the film, Edward Wilson displays little emotion and seems unaffected by the suffering that he causes, since his position largely separates him from CIA operations. At the film's finale, Wilson enters the CIA's new Langley headquarters, retrospectively foreshadowing the highly technologized espionage of the 21st century. Matt Damon's presence links the film intertextually to the Bourne franchise, which features extensive technology, but also physical and mental suffering. Wilson's distance from suffering decreases as the film progresses, but many other characters in espionage experience this suffering from the get-go. These spies are far from the near superhuman status of James Bond or Ethan Hunt, rather presented as the civil servants they technically are, following the orders of their governments. This fulfills another feature of the thriller genre, described by Rubin as a double world, which is both extraordinary and ordinary, adventurous and non-adventurous. Historical settings make these films ordinary because of the absence of high-tech equipment that often seems akin to science fiction, but this also makes them extraordinary because these spy films are distinct from the spy films that do feature technological spectacle. Espionalgia de-romanticizes spies to make them more ordinary, human, and even sordid. Thus, there are personal squabbles amongst the young agents in the debt prissy men bicker in Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy, assassination is discussed over dinner in Munich. Without the mediation of technology, these narratives emphasize the consequences of espionage often writ large upon the human body. The body is the most significant presence to fill the void left by technology, and the impact of espionage is often traumatic. Historical films ask viewers to analyze the present state of espionage through the prism of the past, as the historical setting allows for contemporary tensions and concerns to be worked out metaphorically. One persistent concern has been the cultural trauma of 9-11, expressed in various ways within espionage.
Espionalgia often features fragmented narratives, flashing backwards and forwards, and therefore expressing the impact and inescapability of trauma. The Bay of Pigs disaster occurs in the opening moments of The Good Shepherd, and the subsequent fragmentary narrative expresses the psychic break of trauma. Similarly, the debt's parallel narratives express the inescapability of traumatic events and the impact of these events on the development of history, an impact underlined with the physical scar that Rachel bears in the film. Munich performs the most explicit engagement with trauma as the 1972 Olympics stand in for the 9-11 attacks. The trauma of this event haunts the film as schisms in the narrative of a Mossad team tasked with assassinating the architects of the Munich attack. These flashbacks are strange because none of Munich's central characters were present at the Munich Olympics. However, many people who were not in New York or Washington that day experienced the event as a cultural trauma. The parallels with 9-11 are apparent from the beginning of Munich, as early scenes feature various people, including Israelis and Palestinians, watching the events in Germany unfolding on their televisions, just as many witnessed the collapse of the World Trade Center. Trauma proves inescapable as espionalgia thrusts its characters and viewers into the violent world of espionage. The spy thriller has long been an especially effective format for dramatizing the, con the conflict between private and public spheres, and it features the entanglement of ordinary citizens and their ordinary lives in the perils of international intrigue. Espionalgia shows that international intrigue involves ordinary people and that their domestic troubles do indeed become entangled. The search for a Soviet mole in Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy is interwoven with George Smiley's fractured marriage. His wife's affair with his colleague, Bill Hayden, gl only glimpsed in fragments. The debt blends domestic drama with spy thriller. The Nazi war criminal hunted by Mossad agents works in a fertility clinic where his wife is the head nurse. Once they capture him, the agents and their prisoner effectively become a family with debates over feeding and cleaning. Wilson in The Good Shepherd keeps his work so separate from his family that Clover screams, I don't know anything about you. However, even Wilson cannot maintain the separation as his son joins the CIA only to become engaged to a Soviet agent and Wilson orders her death. The film does not shy away from the brutality of this murder as the victim is shown thrown out of a plane, her falling body echoing similar images from 9-11. The most emotional Wilson becomes in the entire film is when he embraces his grief-stricken son, insisting that he loves him despite what he has done. Who is he really trying to convince? Most explicitly, Munich features several shocking and gruesome scenes which emphasize the violent impact of respionage. Trauma invades the scene, the home of protagonist Avner and steadily erodes his righteousness, leading to a scene of breakdown. The love scene between Avner and his wife is the climax, dark pun intended, of the film's metaphorical restaging of 9-11 as the lovemaking is intercut with the massacre of the Israeli athletes. Scenes of the hostage crisis appeared earlier, but Munich's cross-cutting of the film's conclusion highlights the traumatic schism. Even after the Mossad's team's mission of vengeance is complete, nothing is forgotten or healed. In the film's coda, Avner tries to fill this gaping wound by demanding evidence that the men he killed were responsible. No such evidence is forthcoming, depriving Avner and the film's viewer of any disclosure or resolution. Espionalgia acknowledges the way history and myth are elided in national memory, highlighting the selective emphasis of nationalistic pride through the inclusion of questionable acts and brutal violence. Furthermore, Espionalgia performs the conflation of past and present to question ideas of progress. They create a time warp effect in order to suggest that historical change has not necessarily moved society forward. In post 9-11 political discourse, nationalistic rhetoric has been used to justify the treatment of terror suspects, military interventions in the Middle East, and tighter immigration control. So to conclude, espionalgia presents such rhetoric ironically suggesting that even if characters believe it, the audience are not supposed to. 
Far from being a celebration of past events, espionalgia is a confused, blood-smeared lens that tries to make sense of the present by restaging it in the past. In doing so, this subgenre exposes the hollowness of nationalistic pride, both historical and contemporary. Apologies, I think I just went over there. Are you still with us, Ivan? Ivan did send me a, a quick message to say that his, his Wi-Fi had dropped out. I just want to see if he's here. I'm going to assume not then. OK, I'm going to thank you very much, um, uh, Vincent. I'm going to introduce Stella um, and then hopefully Ivan will rejoin us when he's back up and running. Um, so just give me one second just to find my right space. Sorry about this. Is that working? Can you see my slides? Yeah, you're good. Good, you're good. good. Let me just find one. <laughs> I'd apologize for the technical issues, but you know, we always have them in person as well, so never mind. <laughs> um, okay, so our final speaker on this panel um, is Stella Gaynor from the University of Salford, uh, who's an associate lecturer and a visiting lecturer at Liverpool John Moores University. Um, Stella completed a PhD titled Made for TV Monsters in 2018 and is currently developing this into a monograph. And she's published uh, chapters in edited collections covering the global spread of The Walking Dead and the religious cult in The Returns. She has an article coming out this year in The Revenant Journal discussing Black Summer, and she regularly blogs for critical studies in television online. And her paper today is Better the Devil You Know, Nostalgia for the Captured Killer in Netflix's Conversations with a Killer, the Ted Bundy. <coughs> Thank you, Stella. Over to you. All right, thanks, Laura. Um, as you can probably guess from the title of this paper, there is some murder detail in here, and I was going to give you a warning, but I think um, Tom Watson has already pushed us through that barrier, so thanks, Tom. Um, for our little people in the room, a little bit of a warning that I am going to talk about murder. Okay, so two days before his execution, convicted killer Ted Bundy confessed to the murder of over 30 young women in the Pacific Northwest of America and in the state of Florida. In an effort to buy another stay of execution, Bundy finally admitted his guilt and gave further details of his heinous crimes. Despite these horrors, Bundy remains mythical and legendary in the world of true crime. In the 2019 Netflix four-part documentary, Conversations with a Killer, the Ted Bundy tapes, recordings of Bundy himself are gathered alongside real news footage, courtroom footage and police reports from the investigation, the manhunt and the subsequent trial and execution paper will explore the nostalgia contained within the series for a simpler time when America knew who its killers were and was safe in the knowledge that such monsters will be brought to justice at the hands of the state. So the serial killer as you, you, you can't say that word, ubiquitously American figure, there we go, represents a simpler threat from a simpler time when evil had a single and knowable face. True crime has seen an explosion in mainstream popularity in recent years. Netflix has extensively added to its library of true crime documentaries, and there's been a notable increase in true crime podcasts and dedicated social media pages. There are several iconic accounts of serial killers in literature. For example, Michelle McNamara's personal pursuit of Joseph D'Angelo, the Golden State Killer, in I'll Be Gone in the Dark, on the right-hand side there, that was in 2018. And Anne Rule's account of knowing and working alongside Ted Bundy in The Stranger Beside Me, released in 1980. And both of these feature on the New York Times bestseller list. So why does this barbarity make for such a prevalent subject for TV content? Simpson suggested that the serial killer narrative and the public reaction to them suits the narrative conventions of folklore. Gray and Bond Maupin suggest that the serial killer television content supplies the fear and tension of a good TV drama, and at the same time, it offers reassurance through the representation of the murderer as other deviants, and importantly, to invoke nostalgia, caught. <clears throat> Such content goes into as much detail as it can, poring over crime scene photos, locations, and evidence. Such detail on the forensics, says Bruzy, is an almost fetishistic fixation on evidence. 
Silby says that the presentation of such detail is evidence verite with real footage of victims, crime scenes, arrests and even confessions shown to the audience as it is shown and used as evidence in court, effectively placing the viewer in a position of investigator or even prosecutor. And Smith argues that on television, the serial killer has entered fictional drama and become a conflation with the superhero, which is a sign of current American culture in its depiction of a reaction to powerlessness in the face of nameless or faceless terror. So discussing Dexter, Smith is implying that the acceptance into US culture of the serial killer, a figure who has become inevitable and in turn inflated to fascination and even admiration. So conversations with the killer, what I'm going to talk about, and the pattern of similar content offers valuable insight into why a culture has such a fixation on serial murder. With such a frequency of real life murder on TV and every single newscast that we see, it is worth noting that Bundy's televised trial, at the very least, and the media spectacle that surrounded it, is directly responsible for the swathe of serial killer media that we see today. For this discussion regarding nostalgia, the crux of it lies in the simple fact that Bundy had a conclusion to his story and to his media spectacle. In such a restless United States, facing uncertain times of no end in sight, these stories, neatly, these neatly tied up crime stories where American justice prevails is a source of comfort to a highly troubled nation. Conversations with the killer, the Ted Bundy tapes, presents the actions of convicted serial murder Ted Bundy through his own recorded words and the remembrances of those tasked to find him, those tasked to defend him, prosecute him and execute him. Between 1974 and 1978, Bundy snatched and brutally murdered over 30 women across a number of states. When under the supposed watch of Colorado deputies, Bundy leapt from a second floor window and ran off into the mountains. Six days later, he was caught. In fact, I think he gave himself in because he was cold. So Bundy escaped again, then he made his way to Florida. In February 1978, Bundy broke into the Florida State University Chi Omega sorority house and viciously attacked four female co-eds. Four weeks later, Bundy kidnapped and killed 12-year-old Kimberly Leach. Bundy was eventually arrested in 1979 and sentenced to death in the electric chair. Bundy awaited his fate on death row until 1989, when despite appeals and the exchange of detailed confessions for stays of execution, on the 24th of January 1989 at Florida State Prison, Bundy was executed while crowds gathered outside the fences with beers, placards, pins and, and homemade commemorative t-shirts. Conversations with the killer brings no new evidence to the table, nor does it tell us much about who his victims were, and it barely touches upon the most loathsome aspects of his crimes, namely the rapes, the torture, and the necrophilia. Instead, Conversations with the Killer presents Bundy as an enigma, as a puzzle to be solved, and most worryingly, as a figure to be in awe of. Conversations with the Killer presents a nostalgic look at the 1970s and the actions of this serial murderer. The chief content officer at Netflix, Ted Sarandos said, if somebody has a great take on something that is hugely familiar, then such content with repetition and cultural references, familiar characters and monsters serves the Netflix algorithm and strategy of recommendations. End quote. So the full season drop of the retelling of a known story further perpetuates the temporal duality that True Crime has. This series is available all, all at once, on demand, as Netflix allows us to do, rather than unfolding over a number of weeks. And this supports the presentation of the serial killer, as Stella Bruzzi states, as a simultaneous existence, as a reenactment of events that have concluded, and an enactment of those events as if they have not yet happened. End quote. The Netflix interface allows the viewer to skip the title sequence, which in theory could make the title sequence of Netflix content obsolete. However, in recent years, titles have seen a resurgence that have made some worthy of acknowledgement like Stranger Things or True Detective. And I know I like to leave ones on that I, I enjoy the titles and I leave them playing, I don't skip. So Conversations with the Killer then, it features titles that both align the show with its general feeling of nostalgia for the 70s, and more harrowingly, it aligns Bundy's words and Bundy's claims that pornography was to blame. So the creator of the titles, Lisa Boland, she stated that Bundy's warped sense of self inspired the idea of using a clear cassette tape as a lens through which we can see, from his point of view, the real Ted, end quote. And as we can see, the real Ted throughout conversations was arrogant, deluded and entirely lacking in remorse. So the title sequence then, it steeps Bundy's crimes in a very, very warm nostalgia. 
and the presentation of pictures of his victims alongside softcore porn pornographic images supports Bundy's later claims that pornography was to blame for making him commit serial murder of women. So in short, the titles moved the blame away from Bundy. The music on the titles and throughout the series feature synthesizer brass and, brass and strings with timbres and reverb synonymous with the 1970s and 1980s sounds. The titles open with the pressing of record on the tape deck in close up and with slow paced synths mixed with the echoing of Bundy's words over sepia tinted images of his past and images of a wholesome childhood. Next, a soft core yet highly sexualized image of a model appears and then it's immediately followed by the faces of Denise Nasland and George Ann Hawkins, Sims of Bundy. Then we get a picture perfect image of the 1950s. I think this is actually from, uh, from an advert at the time. But then we get more pornographic images, still with this slow, dreamy synth mixed with Bundy's words, before the tape counter clicks over from 74 to 75, the years when Bundy committed many of his crimes. So what we have here is his wholesome childhood, it's sepia tinted, then we get a pornographic images and then we get victims. So what these titles are telling us is that it was porn that forced him to do this or it's, it's putting it in that timeline that agrees with Bundy's ridiculous excuses. So the pace picks up throughout the titles and images of Bundy follow with images of skulls and um, printed headlines, images of his car, and they move underneath the, the clear tape in collage with more pornographic images of women. The image of Brenda Ball joins Nasland and Hawkins in a collection of images of more images rather of Bundy's car, a crowbar, maps where he killed, and then yet again, some more softcore images. So this merging of victim and pornography simplifies before we've even been retold this story, what happened and why. Starting with a gentle look at Bundy's early years, the pornographic image is presented to us before the first image of the victim. That this comes first clearly adds support to Bundy's ridiculous and insulting excuse that pornography is to blame. The nostalgia for such a time as presented on these titles through the tint and through the tone is reflected throughout the series for a simpler time when evil made sense. Conversations with the Killer offers a vehicle in which to wallow, winth and with, winth? wince and withstand Bundy's past crimes. And by not offering any new information as such, the retelling of this harrowing story further perpetuates both the man as misplaced myth and encourages a feeling of nostalgia. Any regret felt by the viewer and those tasked with catching Bundy arises in the despair over what Bundy got away with and for so long, a despair that, as I shall explore in a bit, tends to awe. So Bundy's active years of serial murder in the late 1970s, as presented in conversations with stock footage of the locations of his crimes, overlaid with Bundy's recorded words from the tapes. In episode one, titled Handsome Devil, which uh, takes us to Lake Sammamish, Washington State, where Bundy abducted two women on the same day, Denise Nasland and Janice Ott. We take a journey through the park, or well, that sunny park, on July the 14th, 1974. Now, I apologise, I don't have the actual images from the Netflix show itself, because I'm sure many of you have tried to do it in the past. You can't screen record from Netflix because it won't let you. So I found other images that um, explain what was going on that day. But in conversations with the killer, when we go to Lake Sammamish that day, the footage gently flickers and gently clicks as the reel moves through the projector. We can see the sprocket holes at the left hand side of the sepia tinted and scratched film stock. Young people lie in the sun, they have picnics, they play sport, they dance, they water ski and swim, while the Rainier Good Tide Band plays chirpy, upbeat music to accompany the wholesome activities. We're presented with a false image of the 1970s, a decade remembered as one as freedom and self-expression, when in fact the decade was angry and turbulent and one of judgment and repression. Bundy shattered the picture perfect day at Lake Sammamish, the score changes accordingly. The gentle whirring of the projector gives way to a rising synth string as the young folks mill around near plentiful police cars and posters declaring the girls missing are posted around the park. Bundy, it seems, has broken this peaceful idyll, this wholesome image of the 1970s. This wholesome image of the 1970s, however, is fabricated for a manufactured nostalgia. It's a marketable commodity. The outlook formed by every generation is formed by events occurring when that generation is most impressionable. The feeling of being or having been integrated into a certain time imparts a sense of belonging and purpose. Conversations collects these 
together those that interviewed, chased, tried, defended, prosecuted, and even escaped from Bundy to recount his story. Seeing that conversations present us with nothing new, one might ask, well, why tell the story again? We've already seen that the crime story suits television structures and that conversations wallows in the murky tale. But for those that were directly involved, why revisit such horrors? Well, nostalgia, while being bittersweet, it also, inv also invokes a sense of being whole, a sense of belonging. The various police reporters, um, police and reporters, even witnesses, in a sense, they still belong to Ted Bundy. In the 1970s and in the subsequent trials in the 1980s, Bundy gave them purpose and was the basis of key events in their lives when they were young and impressionable. Many of those involved with Bundy were in the early informative years of their lives, of, of their careers. So the, the people that we see interviewed in conversations with the killer, we've got Ward Lucas, who was a young TV reporter at the time. Kathleen McChesney was a young detective. Margaret Good was a young and idealistic defense attorney for Bundy. And Polly Nelson was only a junior associate at her law firm with no experience in criminal law or the process of appeals before she secured three stays of execution for the death row Bundy. However, as much as their nostalgia for the 1970s is tinged with murder and regret, they, or rather those that wanted it so, can look back at the Bundy tale with some degree of satisfaction and control, as the state delivered the ultimate punishment and executed Bundy in 1989. This end to the tale provides a sense of control and, importantly, a keen sense of closure. <clears throat> Bundy's story and reign of terror is over, but nostalgia for those involved in the Bundy case and for those that seek out this same story to be told again and again is based on the need for the comfort, comfort and reassurance in a story of good versus evil where good triumphed over evil. In contemporary America, the perceived evil is constant and ever present threat with little to no closure. The captured serial killer like Bundy, Gacy, Dharma, Warnos is an iconic image iconic image of Americana and folksiness, even a perverse kind of nostalgic fondness for a time when the enemy was a sim simple and single figure. Now, America has a long and proud history of the serial killer. That the figure of the serial murderer is so linked to the USA is not a symptom of anti-American rhetoric, but rather of a sense of misplaced sense of national pride. The serial killer is, as, is an American as apple pie. So conspiracy theories aside, America loves a simple tale with a closed ending. Lee Harvey Oswald, for instance, assassin, one man, and then shot dead in an act of revenge by another lone, one man, Jack Ruby. John Wayne Gacy, serial murderer, one man, arrested, confessed, and executed by the state. Timothy McVeigh, domestic terrorist, acting alone, apparently, arrested and executed by the state. Ted Bundy, serial rapist, serial murderer, eventually caught, imprisoned, and executed by the state. So these figures, they meet their comeuppance at the hands of either good old-fashioned revenge in the case of Oswald and Jack Ruby, or righteous American justice at the hands of the state. The all-American serial killer or murderer tale with a closed ending provides solace and supports feeling of security and pride in America and her com competence and in her strength. Conversations with the killer, however, does little to honour the women who were murdered or attacked by Bundy. Instead, the series and those that recount speak more of being in awe of the killer. Bundy is various, variously described as an enigma by the interviewer Hugh Ainsworth, as a mystery to be sold by Utah State Prison psychologist Al Carlisle, as significant by Ward Lucas, the TV news reporter, and Kathleen McChesney describes him as creative. In episode three, Sheriff Ken Kitsavis wears an expression of wonder as he recounts the high number of murdered women across so many states, a number possibly in the triple digits. Kitsavis later recalls how he realised when Bundy's identity was finally understood after he was arrested for the Chi Omega murders that somebody very special was being held. Kitsavis also shows pride in himself and his team when they finally get the imprint of Bundy's teeth as hard evidence that it was Bundy who savagely bit the FSU co-eds during the attack. Kit Savis is proud that he outmaneuvered the extraordinary Bundy. For conversations and for those that featured in it, Bundy is superhuman and Bundy is definitely the star. Indeed, for the serial killer industry more broadly, Vronsky identified the shift from serial murder as, murderer as repellent monster to a superhuman star with the vast media coverage of Bundy and his trial. In essence, Bundy's got a lot to fucking answer for. In conversations with the killer, 
Bundy is described as described using words of awe and wonder. Bundy the enigma, Bundy the mystery. With the smallest of actions, Bundy's moves were heralded as genius, despite such actions being simple and obvious. So we changed the side that his hair was parted on for a police lineup. He grew facial hair and he shaved facial hair. When the heat got too much in Washington state, he moved across state lines to avoid arrest. Hardly the actions of a genius, but by holding Bundy up in this way, the discourse around the man and his crimes and the attempts to solve and catch him always stay in favour of the authorities. The police and the FBI remain on top because Bundy was such a genius and it was therefore not their fault that they took so long to catch him and then fail on two, two occasions, two occasions to keep hold of him. The reputation of the authorities stays intact. In episode three, Not My Turn to Watch Him, the title of the episode alone points to the shifting of blame even inside the police department. Bundy was left alone, unshackled by an open window and he hopped out the window. Later, Bundy escaped from his cell and to fool the guard, he piled books under his bedclothes like we're in an episode of fucking Scooby-Doo. However, throughout conversations with the killer, the onus is put not on the ineptitude of the police and the problems exacerbated by state forces refusing to share information, but instead on Bundy's brilliance, how Bundy is always one step ahead. Carol Durant, who escaped Bundy, Bundy's kidnapping attempt shows the only frustration in the amount of time it was taking to catch him. She recalls wondering in frustration in August 1975, why can't they find this man? The law enforcement agents are always left unblemished. They're the folk heroes to Bundy as the folk devil. In conversations, Bundy was and still is held up as a genius and the failings of the police are never under scrutiny, which leaves the reputation of the authorities always intact. This rhetoric of omitting scrutiny repeats itself in American history and in its culture. So to conclude then, Conversations with the Killer presents Ted Bundy as man and myth. Enough time has passed that the barbarity of his crimes has given way to awe and almost admiration, and his actions are presented through a nostalgic lens in this four-part series that looks back at a time when evil could be caught and brought to justice. Conversations presents a temporal duality to the event and there's a comfort in a, in a well-known tale that's repeated and often told. The title sequence to Conversations with the Killer paints an idyllic version of the 1970s and in a very problematic design move, images of the victims are interspersed with images of softcore pornography. Conversations ignores the mistakes made by the law enforcement authorities and by the end focuses on the successful completion of the death penalty, demonstrating the control and the competence of the US. The serial killer is quintessentially American, and this brings about a perverse pride in Bundy and his ilk, a comfort in the known and white American killer. This pride in and awe of Bundy overtakes any real examining of the faults made by the police during his active years. The public reaction to Bundy, his crimes, his trial and execution, can be examined and should be examined as part of a wider exploration of the violent history of the US and a false and manufactured nostalgia for turbulent times in history. That's it. That's great. Thank you, Stella. And um, sorry, I wasn't here to introduce you. I got chucked out of my Wi-Fi, but I'm back. Um, thanks for Laura, to Laura for stepping in. Um, so um, thanks to all four of our speakers. It's been a really rich uh, and vivid um, panel. I, I really very interesting. We don't have a lot of time before the, um, the lunch break. We were supposed to um, break at 10 past 12, but if people do have questions, and hopefully they do. We can we can drift for about five break. minutes or so, Ivan. I want to make sure people get a break, but obviously we had a we had a bit of a technical issue. So if we drift to about quarter past, that's fine. I think that sounds good. OK, so if people want to um, raise hands or type questions into the um, into the chat stream. Um, floor is open. I got a question. Can I ask a question then? Oh, go on, go on, go on. Who's that? It's me, it's Hannah from Cardiff University. Hi, everyone. Thank you for a great panel. Hannah, um, uh, yeah, my question uh, is for Stella. Uh, that was a uh, uh, mega interesting. You've really made me think um, about a lot of the uh, true crime things I've been watching uh, in a different way through what you were talking about um, uh, with the uh, nostalgic registers there. And uh, that being the case, I just wonder if you've noticed that nostalgic register colouring any other examples of contemporary cr true crime that you've seen? Uh, my mic on, yeah. Um, well, do you know what? I was thinking about that this morning and because my my entry into true crime, I suppose, has been via um, via comedy. So my first stuff that I got into 
with regards to true crime was things like Oh Killer No Filler, Cult Leader, the last podcast on the left, where they approach such crimes and such events via, you know, stand up comedians talking about it. So it was all, um, it was n- n- none of it was never meant to, you know, be, to be rude about the victims, but most of it was just, you know, as much as possible taking the piss out of these horrendous monsters and belittling them because that's kind of all that they deserve. And I've not really come across much nostalgia as such in terms of what I've been listening to. What I've watched in the last 12 months, there's been two um, things about the Yorkshire Ripper. So there was the BBC one, the very British murder that was, was it a two parter or a three parter? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. was it, well, yeah, I can't yeah. remember. And it went on for long enough, didn't it? Anyway, um, and then there was the Netflix one that got released a couple of weeks ago. And with the BBC one, I think that made me feel some nostalgia of an older Manchester because a couple of the murders occurred in South Manchester where I live. So I think I felt a bit of, oh, I remember when, kind of remember when Manchester or I looked a bit like that. And, you know, the old footage from um, certainly Chapel Town and Leeds where I've got friends as well. So I felt a bit of nostalgia that way, but only because it was footage of places that I know that I'm from. But apart from that, in terms of to actually fully answer your question properly, um, everything that every other bit of true crime that I generally engage with is usually framed in in comedy, because that's maybe the best way that I can deal with all this horrible stuff is to have people making me laugh about it at the same time. <laughs> Thank you, Stella. Other questions? I, I have a question, if I can be a bit cheeky. Um, I thought it was for Stella, but I think actually it's probably for all of all four of our speakers in a way. Um, the notion of the folk hero as attached to Ted Bundy came up, and I thought there's something kind of interesting about the folk heroism of almost attached to the aesthetics and the, the placing of the different um, topics being discussed, whether it's espionage, or whether it's 1930s um, Berlin, or, or the, the sort of aesthetic of, of black metal. And I'm, what, what, what occurred to me listening, listening to, to your paper, Stella, was the, the, the book by Hallie Rubenhold about the five, um, about the victims of, of Jack the Ripper and how there's a kind of oh. contrast between the, <laughs> that one, yeah. <laughs> between the, the, you're talking about the sort of, almost national pride of, you know, this, this all American uh, serial who was caught and executed. And in, in the UK, there's almost a kind of, um, there's the Gothic myth of the elusive Jack who got away with it and, and the fixation on him rather than on his victims. Yeah. And I think there's some kind of, and almost an inverse of that in the, uh, in the death metal example of the sort of, you know, this was my life, this was my suicide, what have you done lately kind of thing. And <laughs> I, I think there's, there's something about I think the question is about how how folk heroism feeds through these kind of dark narratives in different ways. I wonder if any of the panel have, have comments. The idea of um, folk heroes as within dark narratives, you mean? Yeah, well, well I was actually, I mean, thinking about it, Vincent, you, you mentioned the sort of um, civil service nature of, of spies yeah. in reality, as opposed to the kind of slightly glamorous, um, bondified um, spies that we, we get in, in cinema. And I think John le Carre always was, was very good at that kind of side of things as, as well. And I, it's almost that sort of the ordinariness. It's, um, I think of Hannah Arendt's thing about the banality of evil, where you have really dark, grisly, gruesome things taking place. We're often drawn to the ordinariness, ordinariness of it. Um, Stella mentioning sort of Manchester, uh, my first uh, first week as a student, I was walking back from from the Hacienda, as, as it was then, and, and there was a murder in Platfields. And I remember, you know, feeling quite sort of, to this day, weirded out that, that you know, a, an ordinary place that I was walking past in the wee small hours could be a sign of, a, a sight of something really terrible happening. And I think there's that kind of, there's almost the ordinariness of, of the things going on in these depicted worlds against the sort of darkness of the things as well. Is that making any sort of sense at all? Or am I sure. just rambling? I think, uh, what I could, well, I'll just say in response from my perspective um, with, my, with what I'm looking at, um, the idea of presenting um, <clears throat> spies as folk heroes is of course immediately difficult because, well, aren't these supposed to be secret um, agents? These are clandestine operations. But it is interesting, I think, that some of the texts within um, espionalgia do play into that. Now, some of them are based on 
true stories like Argo and Bridge of Spies, where you have the um, kind of uh, the, the film protagonists have real world counterparts who then get kind of held up as particular figures. But I think something that the subgenre also does is play with that idea. Um, the Debt, I think, is an especially interesting example because, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, um, these three Mossad agents are held up as become kind of folk heroes within the Mossad community. And then the viewer discovers later on, oh, it's all based on a lie. Um, so in that respect, there's this kind of, I think, deconstruction of the folk hero idea. In that respect, within a quite closed community, Although interestingly, when we have the older versions of the characters played by Helen Mirren, among others, um, <clears throat> Tom Wilkinson and Kieran Hines, they are being they are kind of national heroes. And actually, there's a similar thing comes up briefly in um, Munich um, that the uh, you know Eric Banner's character Avner is held as being a hero within Mossad, but he certainly doesn't feel like a hero. So I think there is an interesting element of this saying like, well, people do these things and. Um, this makes them heroes, but is is it actually heroic? Which I guess goes back to the whole my whole premise of this is a a blood tinted lens. So I think there's a deconstruction of the folk hero going on, um, and which from the sounds of it, I haven't watched Confessions with a Serial Killer, um, but I'm guessing there isn't much in the way of deconstruction going on there. <laughs> no, not really. It's just um, a lot of just. Uh... Oh, he was—he was just incre this incredible, handsome guy who who could he changed his hair and wasn't he a genius? And it was like, no, he wasn't. It's like you—you you couldn't catch him. <laughs> and he was in, yeah, you know, like we saw with in the two uh, Ripper documentaries. You know, when when Peter Sutcliffe is being interviewed forty plus times, you just think, why? Why are we being nostalgic about this? We should, you know. Come on, leave him alone. <laughs> Let the victim it's dress. Fascinating that that his handsomeness should even come into it, as if oh, it's you know, constant. His look or... Anything yeah, written about Bundy, it's just how pretty he was, and it's like, no, he looked like a scrawny, creepy weasel. Absolutely not attractive whatsoever. Not like Zac Efron. Ugh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a, there's a sort of a, there's an interesting thing about Berlin in the 1930s. Thinking about Caitlin's paper where. Berlin in the 1930s is itself a kind of folk hero, but it's the backdrop to stuff going on, which was, which is, is terrifying. I'm thinking about sort of the stuff we get from Christopher Isherwood's memoirs and sort of the Sally Bowles stuff, but you get that kind of notion of 1930s cabaret Berlin, which was this really kind of sexy place, and yet mm -hmm. it's the backdrop to historical trauma, and and you know, and yet you've you've got something much more up front in, in Tom's depiction of sort of mayhem and so on, and sort of murder and the celebration of, of that kind of violence, which has, as you explained, sort of links to, to sort of far right um, narratives and so on. And I think there's something about the way we, the way we look for the sexiness in the, in the darkness is, is, is quite telling, I think. Yeah. I say we, I didn't implicate <laughs> myself too strongly in that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that's what's happening in Babylon Berlin, although I do, but I mean, you're getting at something interesting and I've just, I've sort of noticed a, um, a question in the chat here um, about, um, you know, whether or not there's like a difference between particular <coughs> decades in terms of, you know, the ways that they get depicted and whether they're, you know, um, whether, whether they sort of open themselves up to a more kind of critical analysis of history or whether they tend to be sort of, you know, mythologized in a more kind of simplistic problematic way. Um, and I think that there are probably some eras that are more susceptible to that kind of mythologization because they've been really kind of, whether they're eras or whether they're figures, you know, like Ted Bundy, right? Who are really sort of significant and, and um, have, kind of, you know, um, contributed, have created a sense of national trauma in one way or another, right? Um, they, those types of years tend to be susceptible to that kind of mythologization. Um, but I don't think that that necessarily means that there's only one way that those mythologies can be, can be kind of represented on screen, right? And that's one thing that I think is interesting about Babylon Berlin is that it kind of, it takes what could be quite kind of a simplistic mytho, perceived as a simplistic mythology around Weimar, right? As this just, it was sort of all, 
either really kind of, you know, sexy cabaret, as you say, or like, you know, the rise of the Nazis. Um, and that there wasn't a lot of kind of ambivalence and a lot of kind of, um, uh, it, that it wasn't more complex and nuanced, right? And what the show sort of actually manages to do is use what we understand about those genres, but kind of transfer them to places that we wouldn't necessarily expect to see them, right? Um, by kind yeah. of using the musical on the one hand and noir on the other. Um, so yeah, I think well, it, I think it, it really does depend on the text. The fascination is probably the way in which those two, those different sides kind of link together. It is that kind of merging. Mm. Maybe 1930s is far enough away for us to do that, whereas 1970s, I think only now are we far enough away to begin to kind of look at it distinct and to see it, you know, all sides of it. Uh, there was a question in the chat from, from Mike Wilde. Uh, I think Marika had um, her hand up as well. Heavy metal to post-production. Okay, yep, yeah, Marika. Or oh, it's gone quiet. I'll just talk, uh, just raise the point oh, that Mike makes. Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm in the here. Netflix, the use of very leading school, often single composer synth type scores become ubiquitous. In the Bundy doc, which is, I've seen all of the music is almost scandalous in a way, leading us to embrace Bundy. It would be a completely different series about that music, which I think supports uh, Stella's point. Marika, sorry, go ahead. Okay, um, sorry, I was uh, gonna ask Stella. So um, my colleague Tanya Horak has written a book about true crime and kind of, uh, and part of that is the kind of creation of affect, particularly when it comes to binge watching and the dynamics of, din of binge watching. Um, and yeah, the creation of just emotional response to this. I have to say I didn't watch it because I think we listened to the same podcast and they all said it's rubbish. Um, so um, I was uh, wondering um, what your thoughts are in terms of like how affect may be created or how the dynamics of binge watching kind of influence um, the documentary. I think it has a huge effect because even with, because I say conversations with the killer, Ted Bundy tapes, it wasn't that great, um, didn't offer anything new. And I certainly, I watched it all in an evening because even though I knew the story, I wanted to know what happened next, I wanted to keep seeing the footage. And I was, you know, whether rightly or wrongly, sort of kind of excited by the story despite, despite already knowing it. So it definitely made me feel something. And when I went to see um, Old Killer No Fill Alive a few years ago, and the majority of the audience were all women and the majority of the victims of these crimes are women. And in the pub afterwards, lots of the chat was about why, why are we all listening to, you know, our sisters being hacked up and chopped up constantly? Like what's, what's the connection there? There must be something going on. And one, one drunken reply was that maybe it was just, we're trying to learn to keep ourselves safe or <laughs> we're not, we're not really sure. Um, but I was, in terms of affect and how it how it's making you feel, there's another one about Bundy on Amazon at the moment called Falling for a Killer. And that talks to his girlfriend at the time, his adopted, well, kind of adopted daughter. It looks more at what was going on culturally at the time in terms of feminism and other turbulent things in, in the States at the time that might have encouraged, not encouraged, enabled to a degree what Bundy was doing and the affect of that series was a lot more emotional it made me feel a lot more tearful watching it because I was listening to all these incredible women in the 70s who were fighting for feminism while at the same time they're being chopped up by various killers you know during that decade so depending on how how the documentary is pitched so in conversations he's pitched as a, as a hero and a, as a superstar and I didn't care about him but when I watched Falling for a Killer and I was watching all these women talking, that was when I felt choked up watching that. That was when I really felt it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking it, it's gone water pass and we should probably take a break. Uh, it's been quite a long morning, I think, for, for people. So um, hopefully the chats will continue um, outside this this room and on, on, on Twitter and, and in Discord and so on. So. Um, can I just take this opportunity to thank uh, Caitlin, Vincent, uh, Tom and Stella for, for four really fascinating papers which covered a, a huge amount of territory but had real um, congruence actually 
which is always really nice when that happens. Um, thank you all for your attendance and for your questions and your engagement. Um, go and eat some food, people. Ooh. And uh, we'll be back here at one o'clock, I think that's right, for our, our keynote.